to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Abbasi. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and stroke survivor. And we're going to do things a little differently today. I've got both dogs in here and they both went out for a walk and it was 80 degrees outside, 70 something. And so the bulldog, the English bulldog, um, does not cool off very quickly. So the experiment experiment is that we're going to see if you can hear him breathing throughout the episode. It takes him like a half an hour to stop breathing uh, hard. So he's already cooled down a little bit. I turned the fan on, so we'll see. Anyway, and I've got the Weimar Honor right down here. Let's take a tour, shall we? There's the Weimar Honor. See, I'm proving myself. I really do have these beautiful dogs. And there's the English Bulldog. And there's the fan. So let's see what happens if you can hear him. Um, today, I want to talk about the color wheel of emotions. This is something that I talked about um, closer to the beginning of starting this podcast. And it came up again. I think I ran across a LinkedIn post uh, from somebody that was talking about like pinpointing your emotion, <clears throat> your emotions, like complex emotions. So you may think you're angry, but if you take some time and look uh, and self reflect a little more, you may find that you're actually um, feeling insecure or something like that. So I thought, well, this is what I call the color wheel of emotions. And, um, unfortunately I am not the original, um, it, of coming up with the color wheel of emotions. I Googled it and there are, uh, like diagrams you can, look at that show different kinds of color wheels of emotions. So um, if you want to see what it looks like, you can just Google it. And there's the reason why I think this is such a good um, example of like the complexity of our emotions is that I think because I have a color wheel and Funny enough, those of you who know me, I when I was working, I used to Google my outfits. And it's a brilliant concept, if I don't say so myself. But I would Google like spring 2024 outfits for work or something like that. And I would just browse and see what outfits that I think are attractive looking or neat, or I have different pieces in my closet that are similar to what uh, the picture is. And I would have my color wheel so that I could identify what colors go together because I really wasn't totally sure, you know, I mean, I knew that burgundy goes really well with like a, like a army green kind of um the hues and tints and stuff like that like I could figure it out but it's nice to have this color wheel that shows me what which one of my pieces match so I'd hold up the color wheel to like my shirt and then I'd find it has like a triangle on it and it points to what colors go with it or contrast it um, and that kind of thing. And then I would hold that up to like my pair of pants and I'm there's the perfect outfit. So my brilliant um, dressing that I used to do, I did do it for Mother's Day yesterday as well. So um, I loved bringing this color wheel idea into and now uh, analyzing my emotions. There's a lot of depth to what we feel and when we can pinpoint exactly what's going on in there, we can take the most effective steps towards healing, pain, um, addressing resentments and nurturing our relationships. So let's explore together how to use our emotions as information to 
guide our self-reflection and mindfulness. So think about the last time that you felt off at work or at home. And, and I mean, like, you weren't really sure what it was that you felt, but you just didn't feel good, right? Did you stop to name the actual feeling? Um, those of you who are lifetime listeners, I talk a lot about naming what we're feeling. And I always say that because I think um, I spent my whole life thinking that I was unique discounting my feelings, thinking, oh, I cry too much. I'm too emotional. Um, and it wasn't just what I came up with. People told me that. And so I thought that something was wrong with me. But I've grown into this naming my feelings because it feels like it validates my feelings. You know, I'm not unique. If I was unique, unique, there wouldn't be a name for what I'm feeling, right? So I feel like naming my feelings is the first step in understanding me and the situation that I'm in. So often we'll use broad terms like I'm stressed out, or I don't know, I'm just upset. But these feelings are the most obvious emotions to name but do they really identify what's going on inside there um i don't think they do i think that they are just really um a category of what you're feeling so for example there's a difference between feeling you know i can feel um upset right and if I'm self-conscious about something, I can feel upset. If I'm confused about something, I can feel upset. <laughs> that makes me laugh because when I don't understand something or I'm confused, I get, sometimes I get really agitated to say the least, <laughs> um, but I can feel upset. So both of these are very different from each other but they can make you feel upset. So it's important to dig a little deeper and figure out why we're upset. So self-consciousness might prompt you to engage in empowering self-talk um, to address the problem, while confusion could be a sign that you need to reach out instead of inward you need to reach out for clar clar clarification or help so both cause stress both can make you feel upset um, but they they need to be addressed very differently from each other sometimes of course we need professional help to allow us to dig deeper because it's difficult to see inside of us with our own eyes. And that is one of the challenges I have. Um, no matter how in touch I feel with myself, um, I, I still can't sometimes analyze what it is that I'm feeling. So I went, to, you know, I started going to a psychiatrist lately because of that. And, um, and it's been really helpful for me. And I told you guys recently that when I started going to the psychiatrist, I was thinking, um, yeah, like this lady's going to know me better than I know my, <clears throat> myself. Like I have spent my, the past eight years of my life, um, working the AA program and doing the steps, like I've got it all figured out. And um, I know better than that, but I still felt that way. And I, from day one, I have learned something about myself and I continue to. So it's not, um, it's not unusual to need to seek help. Even if you don't really think you need it, you can always benefit from it. Take it from me. So 
this is where this idea of all these complex emotions and looking, doing some self-reflection, this is where I got this idea of the color wheel. And unfortunately, yeah, I didn't come up with the idea. It would be nice if I did and I could make millions, but whatever that idea is, is still coming. So I'm still waiting for my multi-million dollar idea. So we'll see. Stand by on that one. Anyway, you can Google the emotional color wheel uh, to see diagrams, but just like artists use the color wheel to mix paints, we can use this idea of an emotional color wheel to identify how our feelings mix together and create new feelings. And if we can figure out what those root feelings are that are combining to create that, um, that secondary or tertiary feeling, we can start understanding ourselves and, and realize like when this happens, this is my feeling that that I often go to. How can I address it? So the emotional color wheel helps to break down those broad categories of emotions into more specific feelings. And it divides emotions into these broad categories of emotions um, into those are split into primary. And then as they mix, and mingle with each other, you've got your secondary and tertiary levels, much like colors. So our primary emotions are the basic emotions like anger, sadness, and joy. But as we move outwards in the color wheel, I would say inwards in the color wheel, actually, if I'm using my color wheel that I have in my closet, um, these emotions can blend and evolve into more nuanced feelings. All of our feelings have a root primary emotion. And if I can figure out what that root emotion is, I can address it more easily by taking action. I was, for example, feeling a lot of negative stuff. Um, just three months ago, I was feeling that I was sinking in, I, I was sinking into a depression and there were so many of these feelings that I had, it, there was just so many to try to name that it became overwhelming. There were one after the other, something was piling up. Like, what if this, what if that I'm sad because of this, I'm angry because of this, you know, and it just started overwhelming me. I couldn't even make out the colors. Um, what's interesting is the more of these that combine, the more of these colors that combine, it becomes dark, right? It becomes black. That's what happens when we when we mix a bunch of colors, it's black. And that's what I feel like on the inside also, my dark place. So it all makes sense to me in this way. And um, so if I can take the time, pause and think about or talk to somebody else about what the root cause, not, not the root cause, but the root emotion is, um, I'm more likely to be able to figure out what to do about it. Um, the emotional color wheel can be incredibly therapeutic. For instance, you might recognize that you're feeling angry, but as you take time to reflect, you realize it's actually frustration. Um, so anger, I think of as more of like a, a aggressive feeling while frustration for me is like a more passive feeling angry seems like i'm gonna lash out frustration is more uh for me i start feeling sorry for myself right and then that frustration can actually be analyzed further 
and you may specifically identify it as um, I'm feeling undervalued or I'm feeling overlooked or I'm jealous. All of these specific feelings can elicit frustration. And at the beginning of frustration, it can feel like anger. There's so many layers to our emotions. I mean, we're fascinating. Our bodies are fascinating. And the more that I learn about the brain um, from my stroke recovery, the more that I learn about balance and how many different senses are involved in our balance. Sorry, I have a <laughs> frog in my throat. But um, there's just, there's not one thing that seems to happen in our bodies that is, um, you know, black and white, that that's, that's clear to understand. If we're dizzy, it could be a million things. Um, if we're sad, also, it can be a million things. It can look like a lot of different things. So it's very complex. And by digging into our feelings this way, we can better understand the root causes of the emotions and how they affect our behavior and our decision making. Um, if I were to start off being angry, like the example that I just had where I'm angry and then I look at it and I further, I recognize I'm frustrated. And then um, I, I continue to self-reflect and I find that I feel undervalued um, and I get down to that. If I were to just react when I'm angry, I'm going to have a quite different behavior and make a lot of different decisions than if I take the time to recognize that, okay, I'm angry because I'm frustrated and I'm frustrated because I feel undervalued. Well, if I'm feeling undervalued, my behavior and my decisions might be quite different where I'm going into my boss's office and saying, um, I, I worked really hard at this. And, um, when you reviewed it, I don't feel like you spent or you overlooked something or you didn't spend enough time. Not like you should go in your boss's office and point fingers, but, um, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you were angry, you might roll into your boss's office and be like, dude, I mean, you could do something catastrophic and just be like, I've had it here and just go off. And, and most likely the situation does not require that sort of behavior and poor decisions. So by consistently seeking to understand our feelings, we can respond more effectively and manage our emotions and how we interact with others. It can save us from resentments that are under construction. My sponsor says that a lot. Um, so how do we apply this idea in real life? I've given a couple examples, but let's say that you're feeling anxious, um, which is a, an emotion that I feel quite often. <laughs> um, the emotional color wheel might help you to figure out that this anxiety actually stems from a sense of insecurity. Um, and quite often that was what I was anxious about in my life. It was insecurity. It was um, imposter syndrome sometimes. It was, but there are ways to address it. And so knowing this, you can choose perhaps to prepare more thoroughly for whatever it is that you're feeling insecure about. So let's say it's a meeting at work. Um, if you are able to identify what it is that's that, um, what specifically you are anxious about, 
uh, within you. You can discuss that with your boss. You can discuss it with a friend. And instead of just letting anxiety for me, if I let anxiety just bubble up and boil over, I will like my voice will start shaking. It's terrible. Um, but by identifying this feeling of in insecurity, I can work on building confidence rather than just addressing a generalized emotion like anxiety. Um, so if I if I were anxious before a presentation, let's say, um, and this is this is true story. When I was anxious prior to a presentation, I I read different kinds of um, books about how to address this. So there's a book called Presence, and and one of the one of the chapters that stands out to me is this this way of presenting your opening yourself up going to the bathroom you know put your hands up in the air and like take up more space and build that physical presence and build that physical uh i guess confidence um but this is different than than feeling insecure feeling like maybe when I'm presenting, somebody's going to ask me something and I'm not going to know the answer or somebody's going to corner me and I'm not going to know the answer like that insecurity. Well, there was no amount of times that I could go stand in the mirror and put my arms up in the air and feel like superwoman that was going to get rid of my anxiety. It never worked. It never worked for me. I tried it over and over again. I tried sitting in a seat, like I would put my arms over the back of my seat to like spread my, open my chest cavity up and um, feel more confident. Like, almost like I've told you guys, when you smile on the outside, you'll it'll help you to smile on the inside. Well, I would try to put myself in a physical position that thinking that if I exude confidence, I'll feel more confident on the inside. And that just, it didn't work. It didn't work for me. I love the book. I'm not um, discounting the book. I think it's great. I think it's important for us to, to put our bodies in these positions to help with our confidence, to help portray confidence. But for me, the best thing that I could do to help my insecurity, because it wasn't anxiety, the anxiety was stemming from insecurity and not feeling like I was really the expert. Even though I was, I didn't feel like it. I felt like I was imposter syndrome. Well, the only thing that was going to help me was preparation and practice. That was the only way that was going to help me increase my confidence and lessen my feelings of insecurity. So by understanding emotions like that on a granule level, I, I avoided making the emotion grow. I was able to stop it in its tracks. And, and once I figured that out, you know, it wasn't like I didn't practice before, but, and I, and I had a mentor and I'm smiling because I'm, I know he doesn't listen to this podcast, but he told me like, just practice, 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 practice. But I didn't draw the line. I didn't connect my feeling of insecurity and anxiety with practice. I didn't realize that if I practice, that anxiety will go away. If I had looked at what was what the anxiety was stemming from, that the feeling of I felt like I wouldn't be able to answer anyone's questions, that insecurity, if I had realized that I would have connected the dots, but I didn't. I was just looking at these 
broad categories of emotions and thinking that that's the thing that I have to address. Um, but it's not, it's that granule granular level that I have to address. Sorry, my, um, Autumn is trying to get comfy. She's so cute. Okay. Um, so this, this understanding can help us settle it, address it. And in the case of things like anger and frustration and things that involve another person that might be uh, contributing to the feelings if we can spend time and look at it on this level, we can build stronger relationships and nurture nurture the relationships that we have. So this self-reflective pause can help us to respond to the situation rather than react. So as today's episode wrap, wraps up, um, think about the last time you felt a strong emotion and try breaking it down um, using an um, emotional color wheel. You don't have to Google it if you don't want to. I mean, if you want to actually look at some examples so you know what you're thinking about, please do. But we're thinking about the secondary and tertiary emotions that might be um, at the root, it might be not the root because that's your primary, but that um, are being created, you know? So think about that complexity and remember that when we feel emotions, um, we're not a victim of our emotions. Like that's what I have always felt like I have just like, I always felt like I was unique and I, and I heard that I was too emotional and I cried too much and stuff like that. I felt like these emotions were happening to me and I had to stop them. Um, but that's just not true. I have learned as I've, I think after I got sober is when I came to the realization and it took time. It took a lot of crying in my sobriety meetings, a lot of working the steps to recognize that these, <laughs> the bulldog is, I don't know what he's doing, but he sounds like a pig. <laughs> um, oh, he's chewing on a toy. Sorry for the interruption. Um, the, yeah, now I forgot what I was saying. That's terrible. I'm sorry. That is so distracting and so rude. Okay. So I have realized that my emotions are my superpowers and they are powerful tools that help me understand myself and they help me help other people. They help me understand the world around me and do something about it. My emotions are the gasoline to my actions. And if I put the wrong gasoline in, my actions are terrible, right? My engine sounds horrible. But if I am able to fuel my actions, my decisions with the right kind of gasoline, which, which happens if I do a lot of self-reflection all the time, it's, it's, I'm filtering out that gasoline, right? Um, emotions are like encrypted data inside our heads. And if we decode it, it is rich with information on how to heal, how to grow, and how to connect with the world around us. So thank you. Wow, that was a good one, huh? <laughs> thank you for joining me on the Recovery Daily Podcast. Again, 
If today's discussion resonated with you, please, please share it with other people. And I have another project that I'm working on that I'm pretty excited about. And um, I've mentioned it before. It's a book. And I had I had been not working on it really because of my head. And I feel like I'm at a point where I might be able to start spending a little bit of time um, typing. So that's exciting. And the more people that I can get um, joining the community, the more inspired I am to write. So tell people, tell people about it. And I appreciate it. So I will talk to you tomorrow.